Good morning, everyone. I'm the Complex Games Apologist, and it's probably no secret to you by now that I am a big fan of Star Trek Adventures role-playing game. If you are a fan of Star Trek, and you want to bring the feeling of Star Trek role-playing into your tabletop gaming hobby, then I think it's absolutely a great way to do so. That being said, the game is very different than a lot of what you've played before, so I've decided to kind of have a learn-to-play series on the topic. We're upstairs in my studio. Let's get started. Today's video is going to be about the task system. The core die rolling mechanic you will use when your character is doing things. I am talking specifically about 2 Die 20 Star Trek. My love for this particular engine is all about this particular deployment of it. And I think because it is a game that seeks to simulate genre, which some people would call a story game, that also means that the different genres that it's going to inhabit are going to change the game quite a bit. Or in an even shorter TLDR, they are not afraid to make big changes among the games. So let's tear into this episode by first beginning with our classic disclaimer moment. I think that Star Trek Adventure's success as a game engine involves several moving parts, and it's hard to divorce one from another. But since we are trying to teach this system and enlighten you about how I think it intends itself and presents itself to be used, we've got to start somewhere. So what are those three parts in brief? Well, one is the task system. Every role-playing game you've ever encountered has one of these. This is the way you roll the dice and why you roll the dice. And often how you roll the dice to decide what happens when the outcome is uncertain and when one player or game master is pushing against the group consensus. I don't want to gild the lily any further. That's what we're talking about today. The second component of Star Trek Adventures that I think closely interacts with the game engine and is pretty important to the task system is the momentum and threat pools. They are the way that you will be purchasing additional dice and they are the way that the game master can change what is happening in scenes after they have been set. Maybe a whole bunch more Klingons run around the corner after you successfully fisticuffed the first group of them but you generated a lot of threat in the process. So this component of the system will get its own video in time, but because I think it's something that's been sort of pushed to the side or not heavily covered in the streams of the game that you may have watched online, like Shield of Tomorrow from Geek and Sundry, I think that it bears mentioning what's going on here. You can, through your actions, aid the entirety of the group just by having momentum, which will let them buy more dice. If I am at the navigation console and someone else is down in the torpedo bay confronting an intruder or an imposter, we can still be helping each other so long as it's the same scene. And a scene can be defined in a lot of ways, and that's the third component of this system, the scene economy, which has definitely been pushed to the side. The idea is that you begin different places and chapters in your story with an interesting, decisive point in mind. And when the scene is over, you move on to the next one. The changes within the scene can only happen when the game master spends threat. And so the scene economy informs the momentum and threat pools, which informs the task system. So let's start somewhere with the task system. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. The core engine of this game is called the 2D20 system because you begin each task with 2D20. Now, there might be some superficial similarities to some other dice pool systems that you might be familiar with, like World of Darkness or Shadowrun. Those are games where you roll more dice to represent greater competence. Well, that's not what's going on here. You default to 2d20 and you're looking for a target number. You look down on your character sheet and you have attributes and disciplines. For any given check, you take a flexible combination of those two to represent what's happening in the scene and what you're trying to do and the sum of those two becomes what you're looking to roll under. And then you count the successes on 2d20 and whatever extra dice you may be purchasing from the pools or earning from assistance from the ship or from your comrades. Now the list of these attributes and disciplines is particular to Star Trek's genre. And that's one of the ways that the Star Trek Adventures game engine stretches 
the 2D20 system further into genre. So, what are the attributes? Control, daring, fitness, reason, insight, and presence. What are the disciplines? Science, medicine, engineering, security, command, and con. Con being steering the ship. So, steering the ship quickly in reaction to something which you might be about to collide with is daring and con. Steering the ship carefully through an asteroid field calmly with plenty of time to spare could be control and con. And steering the ship for hours at a time with your eyes super glued open because you're so tired and you're the only helmsman available, well that would be fitness plus con. Just to give one microcosmic example, there's a lot more to each of these, but I have found personally, in my running of the game, that any time I need someone to do a Star Trek action and it's worth calling for a Star Trek die roll, these are there for me. So before we move on to the blood and guts of how exactly this engine starts to hustle, I want to point out sort of the intent of the rules about what the core difficulty is and why you roll the dice. One is meant to be the base task difficulty something that's challenging enough for you to bother rolling. Now, a min-maxed character working within their wheelhouse will have an attribute of 12 and a discipline of 5. They won't have many other places where they're looking to roll under a 17. So if a player is looking to roll under 17 on at least one of 2d20, they're going to succeed. That is, now what's the question? The Game Master has set up this task. They've described what the consequences of failure are, and possibly what's at stake for success. Alright, well why did we roll the dice? Well, we rolled the dice to see how many points of momentum, how many extra successes we generated. And there are ways to spend this momentum immediately to change and to narrate this result. You can ask for more information when you scan with the ship's sensors. You can create an advantage if you are fisticuffing a Klingon, and that could be that you've pinned his arm against the wall, which will influence your actions and perhaps preclude actions that he will take. And that goes into traits, which is something that we will cover in our discussion of the scene economy. All of these parts interact. Suffice it to say, we are rolling to find out. That's the intent of this system. Now. How often should we roll? Why are we rolling? Well, one of the places that the system defines itself is by saying that the characters are competent individuals. They've been cross-trained in all the fields that Starfleet really considers appropriate and important. And given sufficient time, absence of distraction, and absence of opposition, well, they can accomplish anything. So we're rolling to see if they could complete the task in time to complete the task without getting distracted or interrupted, to complete the task in spite of opposition. So something that one individual can and should be able to accomplish under most circumstances is difficulty one. So what about when we start getting into difficulty two? Or perhaps there's a trait in the scene and something's escalated even to difficulty three. What then? Well, how do we roll more dice, enough dice, and how do we generate enough successes to meet that difficulty? The answer lies in, first of all, getting assistance. You can get help from your fellow player characters who can, you know, sitting in a different console or wielding their tricorder or even just giving some hot tips or counseling, offer just enough to throw in an extra die. And it could be that insight and medical could be how the counselor helps the captain decide what to do about a Klingon who is threatened to perhaps mm, boil the ocean of an inhabited planet next to the ship. And in the negotiation that they're undertaking across the comlink, the counselor's assistance is offered. Next, your ship, which is shared among the crew is an extra die for most of the things that you will do with the ship. 
So that means anytime you steer the ship, the ship adds a die in. This can be, for example, con and engines for when you are swooping around on impulse to avoid an enemy disruptor volley. Further, if you roll a one, that counts as two successes. And then characters can have focuses. Focuses are not a predetermined list, but if you roll under the discipline that you're rolling in this check and your focus applies, then that means that you've generated two successes. To give you some examples of when focuses applies, I have looked at composure, and there's been some intimidating moments across the comlink with Klingon captains, or with the admiral who's nervous about a newly appointed captain succeeding at his first command, and the captain has used his composure focus. By the same token, the head of security, when defusing a torpedo in the bay, which is about to blow up inside of the ship, has used his shipboard tactical systems focus. So you can roll enough successes, even on 2d20, sometimes. In fact, that head of security threw 2d20 and got three successes to defuse that torpedo. It was a pretty impressive moment. It was a very risky one, too. But it may have worked out for the best, because no threat was generated. But we'll get into that later in a future video. Finally, you can purchase additional dice. And you can do that by spending the group's momentum that they've earned in other checks. And you can do it by taking risks. By baiting the enemy, or doing the conspicuous things which are convenient. I.e. adding to the threat pool. And you can mix and match. The first die that you purchase costs one, and you can buy that by increasing threat or spending down momentum. The second die that you purchase costs another two, and the third die costs three. All right, you can only get three more dice, even if you spend your character's determination, which is informed by their values. And we'll get into that when we talk about the pools next time but you're only going to be able to have five dice that your character personally is adding in. And then maybe one, two, two assists, if you're lucky. The system is very cautious and wary of allowing more assists. One, I mentioned, is a number that we're looking out for on the die as additional successes. But 20 is one as well, because that's a number that will generate a complication. A trait that will be added to the scene that can hinder your character. It could be a conflict of interest. It could be a jammed door. It could be that you've diverted power away from key systems that will be needed in the future parts of the scene. Those are the sorts of questions that are at play with complications. And also, when you roll a complication, the Game Master can decline to describe a complication and can instead add two to the threat pool. And the complication range can escalate. It can go from just a 20 to even as high as 16 to 20. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's quite a range of complications and quite a lot of threat that could be generated. It could be that you can roll a success with a very competent character while also rolling a complication. They're not exclusive. So finally, I want to talk about some specific and special circumstances that can arise in the task system. One is succeeding at cost, as in you're rolling to succeed, but if you don't succeed, you can still kind of bite down on it. Perhaps lives are lost in the delaying action as the security chief tries to get everyone out of a cave before the transporters are able to activate and evacuate the away team. Perhaps the ship has to hit one asteroid to avoid hitting a larger asteroid. So that's success at cost. You can't spend momentum to narrate more about a failure in that circumstance. Again, we gotta go to the pools video to talk about that more. Another circumstance though, which is a good and happy one, are difficulty zero checks. Now the Game Master is free to decline and say, well this wasn't worth a die roll to begin with. 
but often if it's something that's taking up time in the scene, if it's something that your character is avidly going after, or you're just trying to help someone or make their way paved in easier bricks, then difficulty zero is the number. Flying the starship, being at the helm, is often described as a difficulty zero task, so that it can generate more momentum for the group. So as you can see, the task system is a starting point for describing what's going on in Star Trek Adventures. It is far from the beginning or the end because all these parts interlock. Of course, I'm the Complex Games Apologist and I'm your guide as we explore this system and we try to make sense of it. I think that it's a beautiful way to bring together television Trek stories that are exciting, character-driven, and informed by the sort of super science procedural adventure action science fiction that is something that I'm so passionate about and that I've tried in other systems to bring about as a feel at the table and that I think Star Trek Adventures succeeds at beautifully. I hope that you stay tuned for more of this series. In the meantime, happy gaming.